So let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are a God who accepts us just the way we are. When we sing out a tune, when we miss a note, or the slide messes up, and you still love us because it really is about the heart that we bring before you. And so, Lord, that's what we want you to minister to as we get into your word and we learn more about the Christmas story, is we want you to touch our hearts, Lord. Open them up and meet us right where we are so that when we leave this place, we leave different than when we came in. Thank you for Jesus, because without him, we would have nothing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we've been going through the not-so-ordinary people of Christmas, and tonight we're going to be in Luke 2. So if you want to turn there and, and read along, and it's a little bit, oh, we're going to do the 21 verses. Yeah, I just did that, and everything went, ooh. Um, but I want you to, to really put yourself into the story. I don't know if you had parents that read to you when you were little kids. Um, I really didn't, but I read before I went to bed at night. And, and I love a good story. And so just enjoy the narrative and enjoy the story and receive what God has for you and listen for the word of the Lord. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken on the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause a great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heavens and on earth. Peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. I love that. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. This young girl had to have so many things going through her head in her heart at that time. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. And on the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. And this is the word of the Lord. Praise Thanks be God. So as we've seen over the last few weeks, like angels, they really, they're a common thread in the Christmas story. They play this large role in scripture. And the angel Gabriel, he visits Zechariah and Elizabeth announcing a baby. And then he visits Mary and he tells her about this immaculate conception. And then he visits Joseph twice to reassure him that everything is going to be okay. 
And angels filled the Bethlehem sky above the shepherds to make an announcement. And they were sent to protect Jesus by redirecting the Magi away from Herod. And then they would come, they'll come to Joseph a third time and warn him to go to Egypt to flee Herod. And angels are really interesting to me. And they were created by and for Christ. And their spirits that at times can put on human form to accomplish earthly missions. They have emotions, they have intellect, they have a will. And in Hebrews 12, it says that angels can't be numbered. So it's really hard to say how many of them there really are that are around us. And they advocate, they make war, they protect, they announce, they teach, they comfort, and they guide God's people. And we really don't know when they were created, but we do know from scripture that before creation of the world, there was a cosmic battle in the heavenlies, and Lucifer, who was the highest angel, who was beautiful and gifted, he fell because he wanted to be like God, and he took a third of the angels with him, and they became demons when they were cast out of heaven. And but yet, in the midst of all of that, there's still hope because even when Satan commits evil, and I think we all have felt like Satan has maybe at times been poking you and attacking you and you wonder why and why isn't God stopping it. And, and, but God allows these things to happen at the discretion of God because he uses those things for his good. And... We know, too, that Christ defeated these enemy powers on the cross. He defeated sin and death and the grave when he rose again. And the angels watched, too, in the book of Genesis when he said, Let us make humans in our own image. And we are these new and unique creatures because we have souls and we have free will. And God didn't need intimacy with another being, yet he created us. And the new kind of being that he created would both love and reject God. And the father of lies would inhabit a serpent and begin his slow work of deception in the Garden of Eden in this new and beautiful world turned dark. And God's image bearers, you and me, we made a destruct, there was a destructive alliance that was made with darkness. And in the beginning, Adam and Eve were cast out of Eden. And here we are today. So angels, though, they watched and they were there and they saw sin overwhelm the human race and they saw the power of God reigning over sin and death and the grave and, and they knew what was happening here that God was doing something new and they tell later on when they when they go to the disciples they, they tell them to go and tell the world and but before any of that can happen before the Great Commission, this baby is born in Bethlehem. And so we come to read about this innkeeper. And I think we can learn some things from the innkeeper. Now Mary and Joseph, they go to Bethlehem for the census, which was in Judea, which was the city of David, and they were both from the line of David, and they needed to go there to register. And the prophet Micah prophesied that in Bethlehem, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. The prophet Micah prophesied that in Micah 5, 2. And so here we have God working to fulfill prophecy. And some scholars speculate that Jesus, you know, they, they argue about where he could have been born in a cave, he could have been born on a roadside inn or a relative's house or a barn. Or, nobody really knows, though, if we're honest. And, but what we do know is that there was somebody there that turned him away and said there's no room in the inn. 
and they're about to give birth to the Son of God, and I can only imagine how, how anxious they must have been. Joseph wanting to care for his for Mary, for the baby, wanting her to be comfortable, wanting her to be safe and dry, and, and for Mary, who's in labor, and, and women know who've had children, it hurts. And she's going into labor and probably wondering, where am I gonna have this baby? This is a young girl. Who, who this was all cast on. They cast between the ages of maybe 12 and 14. Again, a speculation. So we have this young girl, and, and, and then they go and they say, you know, we, we need a place to stay. My, my Mary is having a baby. And, and in the midst of all of this, God has come. And the kingdom of God is being built among the ordinary, the lowly, and the poor. And God is sending his son to dwell amongst these humans who turned their backs on him and sinned against him and started to idolize their own way rather than following God's will for them. So we have this innkeeper, and he didn't know that Mary was carrying the son of God. All he knew was there was no room. But they find a place for him, and, and so he, for them to stay, and, and he's part of the story. And I think that what we can take away from that is the lesson is to be alert and be on attention to what's going on around us. Because we, too, are part of the story, whether we recognize it or not. What they thought was an ordinary night was the fullness of time and the fulfillment of prophecy and all of human history was hinging on this moment. And these are crude circumstances. And then that night, though, was no accident. And our lives are no accident. Mary and Joseph, they, were, they weren't there by coincidence. God used the census to bring them into Bethlehem so that the prophecy from the prophet Micah could be fulfilled. And then my favorite characters are the shepherds. The angels appear in this field, and God chooses them to be the spokespeople for the world. These unpolished, uncouth, dirty, and sweaty, probably, and there were probably some young girls in there, so I'm going to say people, and they were required to tend the flocks outside of the city, and, and sheep were a commodity, and especially because when it came time for the Passover, when they were sacrificed in the temple and they needed sheep, it was an industry. And so you've got these shepherds, and the work would have been difficult. They would have had to ensure that the sheep were well fed, that they were unblemished. They would have to make sure they fended off predators. People came to try to steal and to rob, so they were they would have to keep guard and, and sleep in shifts and work together to make sure that the flock stays together. And, and here in the midst of that, God chooses to announce the birth of Jesus to this unrefined, dirty group of shepherds. And I love that because I feel like that's me at times, especially when I look back at my past, unrefined and, and filthy and dirty, and, and yet God chooses the lowly. And the kingdom of God is for outsiders. It's for the marginalized. It's for the ones that the world cast aside. And Emmanuel means God is with us. And that means he's with us. And the kingdom of God is this beautiful thing. And Jesus, he comes as a savior and he comes as a king and he comes as the lion of the tribe of Judah. But he also comes as a shepherd. We are his sheep. And he says, the sheep hear my voice. So here is this shepherd king who's the birth is being announced to these shepherds. It's no accident. God is Israel's shepherd all throughout scripture. You can see that up until this point, and the imagery is everywhere. And these shepherds, they take care of these vulnerable sheep, and sheep are kind of dumb, too. And we're kind of dumb, too. And, um, but, they're, but they have a way of just, this is 
gentle kind of leadership. And there's this vision of them being firm, and it's how God leads his people with, with firmness and with love. And, he, and, and the Apostle Peter is one of my favorite apostles, and, and when he's reinstated after he denies Christ, Jesus says to him, feed my sheep. He's essentially saying, love them and protect them and teach them and make sure that they grow up and that in the ways, and, and teach them everything that I've taught you. Feed them my word. And now this Messiah is going to be different from the leaders who are there that they have around them. They're expecting a manly king who's going to be born in a palace, but they have this baby that's born in a manger. And the Lamb of God, this is so beautiful, the Lamb of God is going to be held and touched by those who care for lambs. Those who care for the Passover lamb. Jesus is the Passover lamb, the lamb that has come to be the final Passover sacrifice to fulfill the sacrificial system. This lamb won't just temporarily cover their sins as the current sacrifices do. He will become sin for his people. And John the Baptist would say when Jesus was starting his ministry, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And the good news of the coming of the Lamb of God that's slain for the sins of the world, that he's announced among those, that it's announced among these sheep and amongst these shepherds and, uh, that are set aside for temple worship. That's no accident. This is Israel's last great shepherd. He's our great shepherd. And this is God declaring to his people that the good shepherd and the Lamb of God is coming and that he is bringing peace to his people. Peace that they have been waiting for. Restoration that they have been waiting for. And these were simple people. And I, I, I can't say that enough. Because we're simple people. The, here you have the skies opening up and these choirs of angels from heaven are singing and they're announcing the birth of the Son of God and God interrupts their night and he shows up in the middle of an ordinary day and it catches them by surprise and they respond in a way that shows that they can be trusted with the announcement. They had been waiting for this. In the midst of their ordinariness, they had been waiting for this miracle. They saw, they heard, and they believed, and they had awe. And in the midst of that awe, they were afraid. They were terrified, the text says. And so the question I have for you tonight is, has Christmas become a routine? Has it just become just a thing that we do? Or are you willing to put your heart in a place and allow your heart to be awed by God? And today's world is pretty jaded. We don't have to look very far to be sad. We don't have to look very far to be depressed. But Proverbs 9, verses 10 and 11 says, The fear of the Lord, they were terrified. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. For th th through wisdom, your days will be many, and years will be added to your life. Real spirituality is having a healthy fear of the Lord, a reverence, a healthy awe to know that you are nothing, that I am nothing, but he is everything. And when we come to a place where we understand that, and the closer you get to God, the greater that fear and that awe should be. Because the more you recognize who you really are, you start to understand the capacity of the sacrifice that was done for you and for me. But we sometimes we take it for granted. I have days I take it for granted. I, I, I know. I'll be the first one to raise my hand. And these angels... 
They say, fear not. And yeah, we no longer have to be afraid. And we can come boldly to the throne of grace. Yet, we should fear God. And we should fear what disobedience brings. Because there's consequences to our ignorance. And the baby Jesus is born in this odd, probably, I don't even know what it must have been like. I can't even imagine. And he brings peace. And these shepherds, they live with purpose. And, the, and here's another thing we can learn. They didn't waste time gazing into the Bethlehem sky and, and thinking, wow, that was really cool. They took off. Let's go see. And they went because they wanted to worship. And there's been, Michigan has had, you know, the University of Michigan and the Lions had a pretty good game. And I see how excited people are for Go Blue. You know, woo, the Lions finally got one. And we're so excited at sporting events. What if we were even a fraction of that excited about the glory of God? <clears throat> it's really sad to me. Where we'll cheer and we're not embarrassed to look like fools and paint our faces and to run around acting like idiots. But when it comes to the word of God and it comes to coming into the presence of God, oh, I can't, I can't do that. I'm embarrassed myself. <laughs> yeah. Who cares if you embarrass yourself? Because it's not about the people around you. It's about him. This is who we serve. And people are going to hurt you. And people are going to sin against you. And people are going to betray you. But at the end of the day, I know that my God and your God holds me in the palm of his hand. And that evil that comes at me and that is poking me and is trying to bring me down. That he's using that. And maybe it's not even about me. Maybe I just need to sit back and fear the Lord as the beginning of wisdom and allow God to pour his spirit down upon me. And maybe I don't need to understand and maybe you don't need to understand. But what we do need to do is worship. And I love, too, that they were basically the first missionaries. They went and they told everybody about what they saw. And they were excited about it. And that's the good news at the heart of Christmas is that God has come to save you. Amen. The message is that Christ was born to save your soul. And sometimes we need to be uncomfortable. And sometimes we need to, to fall flat on our face. Because it's in that moment that we realize that I can't do this alone and I need him. And so sometimes we have to fall so that we can recognize who is really in control. And it's not about the idol of me or the idol of substances of alcohol or marijuana or meth or whatever it may be, shopping or gossiping or Netflix or whatever it may be. Whatever that idol is, God wants to cleanse those things out of your life because he wants to be what you turn towards, not the things of the world. And that is really what's at the heart of Christmas is that he sent his son into this world and he announces it to these ordinary people who nobody wanted anything to do with. Shepherds were like, Look at those, those people. Get out of town. Go take care of my sheep. Go, go do what you need to do, but do it over there. And these were the ones that Jesus, they got to hold that baby and see that baby and worship that baby. I'm assuming they got to hold the baby. Because I would have asked if I could hold the baby. <laughs> so, so a question I have for you, in what ways is God trying to get your attention? 
What is God asking from you? Because like sheep who have gone astray, he'll let you wander. But eventually he's going to come at you, he's going to take that staff, that staff and whack you over the head and pull you back in, Amen. kicking and screaming, right? You may even have to go to prison for a little while so he can get a hold of you. But he does what he needs to do so your heart can be right and so you can be free. Now Jesus made room for those that wouldn't make room for him. And he says later in the Gospels, I will go and prepare a place for you. That means he has gone, he's, he's resurrected and he has gone and he's preparing a place for those who believe. And, and, I'm, and, and I think what we need to do, we need to look up, we need to listen, we need to put our faith in God because God is on the move. And, and this hurts my heart to say this, but I believe that a lot of people who go to church, I wonder if they're even Christians. And I don't say that lightly, because you will know that we are Christians by our fruit and by our love, in the way we treat people, in the way we treat the people we love, that says who we are in here. And I think one of the, oh, I shouldn't even go there, I'm not even going there. Yeah. Well, you know, in some churches where they'll say, raise your hand if you want to accept Jesus. I think that's a disservice to people because then people leave and they think, I accepted Jesus into my heart. I did. But, but you did, Charlie. But there's more that comes after that. You can't just leave and say, I got Jesus now, and then I'm going to go and I'm going to do whatever I want. No, obedience follows the repentance. And I want nothing more for you and for me to be free. The enemy has been knocking, kicking my butt this week. And you know, on the way here, I'm like, Lord, I listened to the scripture on my, on my Bible app, and I, and I was praying, I'm like, you know what, Lord? I trust you. And I trust you that you're going to take care of those people who are coming at me. And I trust you that your will will be done. But in the midst of it, I need strength, and I need courage. And I need wisdom. Open my eyes and shut my mouth so I don't say something stupid. I want to love you and I want to speak truth. And I think that's what he wants from all of us. And, and we're going to transition into communion. And I'm going to go... To 1 Corinthians 11, Paul's words, as Tim is handing that out, and as I try to learn how to use my Bibles, you know what? So now is not the time to practice. Um, Paul writes, 1 Corinthians 11, starting at verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And now hear this. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. 
A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. And I read that to say, I want to just give you a moment of silence for you to have a conversation with your dad, with your father in heaven. And if there's anything that is on your heart that you need to give to him, if there's anything that you need to repent of, to turn away from, I'm going to give you a little bit of time to have that conversation with him. So that when we partake in this, that we are doing so with a clean heart, a clean mind. And I'm going to leave it at that. So Lord, hear our prayers. Lord, thank you. Thank you for being a God who hears our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. So the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he had took the bread and he broke it, saying, This is my body given for you as often as you partake in it. Do so in remembrance of me. The bread which we break is the communion of the body of Christ. And in the same manner, after they had eaten, he took the cup and he said, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. As often as you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. The cup of blessing which we bless is the communion of the blood of Christ. So Lord, I just thank you. Thank you for sending your son. And thank you that all we need to do is turn, our, is turn towards you when you are there. That you hear the prayers of your people. So Lord, I thank you that the sacrificial system is no more. That we don't have to carry shame and we don't have to carry guilt. Because we are yours. And I know none of us here are perfect, nor should we ever proclaim that we are. So thank you for sending your perfect son for imperfect people like us. Lord, have your way with our hearts, have your way with our minds, and we praise you. Because you are so, so good. If anybody came into this place carrying something, Lord, that that is just lies from the enemy. We bind those things in the name of Jesus and we ask that you remove them and you replace them with your peace, with your grace, your love, your mercy, and Lord, plant hope on all of our hearts. Show us the hope and the miracle that is Christmas. May we not get caught up in the presents and the tinsel and the Christmas trees, but may we recognize the true meaning of the season, which is that you love your people so much that you wanted to redeem them and restore them. So we thank you for Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.
So as you go, know and go knowing that we are more than conquerors. That such a beautiful thing. It's really such a beautiful thing. So as you go, conquer the world in the name of Jesus and may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and may he turn his face towards you and give you peace. Go in peace.